All right, then, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the continuation of our Rockwell Lecture Series on Black Lives Matter. I'm Ann Klein. I teach in the Department of Religion. And therefore, I was present when our department voted unanimously to dedicate this series of Rockwell Lectures to the matter of just how much Black Lives Matter. And we are so delighted, honored, and full of anticipation as we welcome Professor, Professor Rhonda V. McGee to the podium today. Professor McGee teaches law at San Francisco State. She also models for us creative courage and tremendous insight needed to forge a dynamic dialogue between legal analysis and the inner work required to truly bend law and social norms toward justice. She's the author of a rich array of articles with come and read me titles such as Educating Lawyers to Meditate, question mark, Slavery as Immigration. Her book, The Inner Work of Racial Justice is widely praised and even more widely read. It's garnered many important awards and rightly so. It is a remarkable demonstration of how the lens of cultivated mindfulness and the generous heart of kindness can transform individuals and communities, healing into greater wholeness, the social order so fractured in our time. It's an extremely important work, making sure, advising how reality and justice are not just ideas or ideals, but must become integrated with the way we feel and breathe. The profundity and necessity of this combination in our time can't be overestimated. This is what a real education is about. A student here recently exalted, I learned so much about myself in that book. And today we have this wonderful opportunity to learn ourselves directly from Dr. McGee. As you listen, questions or insights may surface, please write them into the chat to Learned Foot, who's writing his dissertation in our department, and uh, he will organize them and help facilitate the Q&A that we will have after we have finished our own listening. So with no further ado, once again, a very warm welcome to you, Dr. McGee, the stage is yours. Let me, um, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Klein. <laughs> I want to just uh, bring myself, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, pre-conversation, um, I'm often um, given the honorific of, of doctor, although I'm just a, a kind of a humble uh, master's in JD <laughs> uh, from the University of Virginia, which is where I got my degrees. Um, but I teach at the Jesuit University of San Francisco. I've been a law professor there for more than 20 years. And so I'm so very honored to have this opportunity to be with you all on the theme of our talk today. I'm so excited. Um, you guys are giving me an opportunity to reflect with you on some of the deep underpinnings, actually, I would say, of the effort that I've been making to expand our our ability to draw on uh, practices with um, legacies in Buddhist uh, tradition and teachings, and in a range, I would say, of other traditions that kind of um, that resonate, if you will, that share in some 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 measure something in common with the core teachings of um, of of the Buddhist traditions that we are fortunate to have inherited in, um, in the United States, in the West, and that I personally am fortunate to have been exposed to through a variety of, of beautiful teachers along the way. So the particular title that I've chosen for this talk is From a Change is Gonna Come to Freedom, Faith Songs, uh, Buddhism, and the Practices of Liberation in the Black human experience. Um, so there are a lot of concepts there, but what I'm offering, what I'd like us to be thinking together about is how it is that 
exploring and turning toward, opening up to um, testimony, uh, stories, um, the opportunity to hear from those who have experienced life um, in a Black body, in a Black racialized body, in a, um, in a body that is known in the U.S. culture as either Black or African-American. This experience, this lived experience, um, I'm suggesting in the thesis of this talk, um, carefully examined, provides a, a really um, insightful set of opportunities for us to deepen um, our understanding of embodied experience generally, right? From the experience, and especially in a world, in a context in which um, racism and white supremacy and its legacies are part of the, if you will, normal science, the, um, the kind of deeply embedded culture uh, in which we have all been formed, and I sometimes say deformed, right? The, the, it, and so in other words, for us to really deepen our ability to bring, I would say, this, the deep teachings of waking up um, into our experience, um, this engagement with what suffering looks like and how it shows up in contemporary culture, not only as a cognitive challenge or a personal challenge around the, you know, the three poisons in the deep Buddhist traditions of um, attachment, uh, 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 hatred, right, greed, hatred, and delusion, you might say, um, in shorthand. So these are these kind of ways in which any one of us may suffer from attachment, from pushing things away, from ignorance and being um, deluded about the conditioned nature of reality and its impermanence and so on and so forth. In addition to those kinds of kind of root causes of our suffering, you might say, we are embedded in a world in which surplus suffering is a reality. And um, to understand that surplus suffering, by which I mean to say, in addition to our existential suffering as human beings, some of us are suffering more because of the way society has embedded into the contexts within which we live patterns and practices through which some people are disproportionately marginalized and subordinated and um, decentered um, and disrespected, dehumanized even, um, set apart by processes of othering and marked in those ways of identification for subordinated treatment, for um, maldistributed, for the consequences of maldistributed resources, including the power to decide how we distribute resources in our society and everything that flows from that. Access to education, access to healthcare, access to just treatment in our systems and institutions of law, and the application of law, um, treatment in religious places and within re re religious doctrine, and on and on and on. So what we're talking about here are some of the ways that, again, oppression shows up in our time. And so I really appreciate that we that this the theme of this conversation is to explore how Black lives, in fact, do matter, and not only uh, matter but give us an opportunity to deeply understand what mattering really means and how we can wake up from deep patterns um, that train us in the, the sense that some lives matter more than others. So I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here, if I may, and would like to go ahead and um, get a bit of a slideshow going here to support us. And I wanna say that this is really a kind of an opportunity for us to co-inquire together. You know, less than, I hope it'll be less than sort of a straight lecture. <laughs> Although obviously I'll be 
presenting some content here and prepared remarks. But as you'll see, what I'm hoping we'll do is actually experience this as a, this as a contemplative presentation, an example of contemplative pedagogy. And um, in that sense, an invitation, not only for me to just present information from afar uh, and for you to sort of, as members of this beautiful, rich audience to simply receive information, but instead to really become present to how it is that we know, how it is that we learn, um, what subjective experience we bring to these opportunities to, to teach and to learn by which our universities and colleges and other places and spaces are characterized. These, um, we are all coming together when we are coming together for purposes of learning from some place. So recognizing our positionality is a sort of a sub invitation, if you will, with the, the sort of sub hypothesis being that our positionality matters much, much more than we realize. And um, it's through the lens of recognizing our own positionalities and being more curious about how in the very many different subtle ways, the particular received teachings we've been given around race and racism and related teachings around um, what it means to be um, worthy show up in um, our places of higher education, our departments of religion, our classrooms, et cetera. So the subtitle, of course, here is inviting us to look at a particular aspect of our experience, what I'm calling faith songs, right? And so we'll be thinking about what does that mean? I have a way of defining that. And I just want to say everything I offer here is offered in the spirit of invitation, recognizing that um, when we come together for human uh, teaching and learning, we're always coming together uh, again, from some place, right? From some places of position and subjective experience through which we know certain things and haven't had, you know, from our experience. And maybe we've learned some things through that first person, second person, and third person, right? Those different dimensions of learning. We know from our own personal experience, we know from engaging with others in the second person sense, and we know from learning by reading texts and um, reading re and, and doing research and, and imbibing research. So we're wanna be, we wanna be drawing on all of those different dimensions of learning and recognizing as well that um, there's so much in the way of opportunity to misunderstand because we're using language that as human beings, we're constantly um, evolving and experimenting with and, um, and deploying in the world, again, from these differentiations and experience in ways that sometimes make for beautiful connections and sometimes uh, make for disconnections. <laughs> so I want to invite us as you receive these terms that I'm using, um, Maybe if you can um, hold the space for um, some uncertainty about meaning and, and kind of moving our way as best we can toward, con toward connection, toward bringing my experience and some of my offerings together with yours, wherever you are, whatever your background. And in that rich invitational way, perhaps deeping our experience of contemplative teaching and learning as part of this engagement today as well. So the idea of faith songs, I'm going to be drawing on my experience as a black woman from the South, born in a particular small town, smallish town in North Carolina. Um, and when I say that, you can hear the accent coming through. Um, uh, and really invite then a reflection on how songs um, in the black religious experience and songs in our human experience, frankly, right? It's a doorway into a broader conversation may help inform our thinking and teaching about some of the core tenets of Buddhist thought and philosophy. And this to me is a kind of an ongoing question. This is, this is a project that uh, in some sense, I'm sure I'll be experimenting with throughout my life. So thank you for being with me in at this phase in the journey, which is a I think fairly 
for early stage for me. I really appreciate it. So here I want to just overview some themes. So faith songs. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna use this phrase surplus suffering in soul, by which I mean, you know, again I just mentioned what I mean by surplus suffering, the additional suffering that is differentially arrayed in our particular contexts, cultures, places, communities, institutions that flows from identity-based bias, practices and patterns of privilege on the one hand, voices that are centered, voices and perspectives and positions that traditionally matter in relationship to voices that are traditionally decentered, marginalized, and matter less. And because suffering results from that, um, disproportionate anguish and angst and material deprivation of opportunity, um, which we can work with and we do, right? Suffering does result, but one of the ways that in the black experience, I think this kind of suffering has been worked with has been through this embodied um, song tradition, giving voice to and um, conveying a sense of self-regard, self-worth, and a compassionate effort to alleviate the suffering that is experienced as a result of oppression. And so, um, you know, I will offer in this talk some examples of the kinds of music that I think has evolved from this um, tradition of faith songs. Um, from time to time, dropping into my own personal experience, drawing in some examples from our broader culture with which I, I'm sure some, if not all of you are familiar uh, to some degree, and differential degrees, I'm sure. Um, Closing, I think, with an example that many people not consider may not consider to be coming from quote unquote the black experience, but really in, by by including the last song that I want to add, I want us to be opening up a sense of what it is that we mean by blackness, and and again bringing um, the spirit of liberation, the spirit of the deep freedom and liberation that runs through these songs that I think runs through and, and, and is what dovetails or aligns this work in reflecting on faith songs and their impact on us, their ability to help support us in healing from embodied trauma, from healing from the legacies of oppression. That there's a connection I feel in my own experience and, um, between those, that tradition and those experiences and Buddhist traditions and practices the liberative potential of these practices for not just waking up, but feeling our a deep sense of our being at home on the earth, at home in these soft-bellied bodies that we temporarily inhabit. And so I want to be making, inviting us to think about the connections between the experience of these songs and the experience of some of our practices in the Buddhist tradition. So I see this again as a doorway to just exploring so-called black experience. And I say so-called because how we think of what we think of as black experience is partly what we're calling into inquiry with this work. We're inviting deep reflection on the, the, the way we define ourselves by, by, in terms of race, the way we define others in terms of race and ways of, um, understanding the false consciousness that can create be created if we hold these ideas of race too tightly. So the invitation then, of course, is to deepen our ability to understand um, race as a concept um, emerging perhaps from the ways in which we we interact in a social world that we didn't fully create, but that we have some agency around. So race is emergent, right? It is emergent as a condition of our ways of being in a world that 
runs patterns of racism. We grow up in a world, we're born in a world where on day one in the United States, we're given a racial identity. Somebody other than ourselves, the states in which we live for many different purposes are about the business of putting on a birth certificate, a racial identity or category, or maybe one or more. And from that day forward, right, we are then meeting a world in which the conditions of racial identity and identification are ever present. And the legacies of hierarchy that result from that are ever present. And that means that whatever our background, we have some experience with this. And if we are racialized as Black, um, we have certain experiences that, um, you know, if uh, though they vary across those of us who may be racialized as Black or um, or maybe um, may have some aspect of our heritage um, and lineage in association with um, the Black experience, although it may be um, multifaceted. There are many people today, of course, who enter into this conversation from a place of um, multiple racialized backgrounds. And so it's become much more complicated. And by the way, because race itself is a construct struck that we've created, in a certain sense, I think we all enter into the conversation from quote unquote, multiple racialized backgrounds. But some of us have a more present experience of that, a more um, conscious identity around that than others. So again, when I talk about the black experience, it's a placeholder for a construct in the world that, that I know um, is not fixed or rigid, either in the social world or in our experiences. It's not um, monolithic in any way, either in the social world or even in our own experiences. And it operates in a in you know in relationships of contingency in which there are other types of bodies being racialized as white, as as multiple raced, as um, Asian heritage, perhaps Latin X, although in some contexts we consider that more of an ethnicity than a race, right? And those who are Latin X are invited then to identify a race within that in a way that other racialized groups or um, so groups that could be also considered ethnicity, black could be considered an eth ethnicity as well, in which um, our experiences around race might then be greater differentiated in some sense, because there are so many different ways in which the black experience is, is manifest in the world. So I'd like to create some um, consciousness around how it is that race itself is constructed as, as, a, as a consequence of the systems of oppression in which we're in. And um, I think these songs will help us explore a bit of that, but I want us also to be always thinking, whenever we're looking at the experience of one group, we are, if we broaden our perspective, seeing some way in which that experience is helping construct the experience of others, whether it is in direct juxtaposition as often black and white are, the paradigm, if you will, of race in America is often thought of as whiteness and blackness juxtaposed. But we know that indigenous peoples, uh, yeah, indigenous to the United States, uh, American Indians, uh, Indian tribes, as they often prefer to be called, um, are also subject to racialization in our hierarchy of races in the U.S., Asian heritage people, Latinx people, and so on and so forth. And so there are often are these patterns of triangulation in different ways that when, again, whenever we look at one group's experience in the background, in relief, we are invited to reflect on what, what are these other sometimes unnamed groups invited? How are they being invited to construct themselves or be constructed in response to the construction of so-called blackness. So as we open up to, again, the fact that we all have some kind of racializing experience, no matter what our background, opening up to reflecting on that experience and then looking at it through perhaps this lens of the black experience that I'm gonna present a little bit more on as we go, 
um, is really kind of what it is we want to um, um, be open to experiencing here. And by the end, just thinking about what a faith song, a song that helps us feel the the verbal resonance of suffering in soul, right? It helps us speak in uh, the, the sort of lyrical and musical uh, ways, right? Um, embodying suffering and a response to suffering, embodying suffering and a compassionate will to alleviate it, embodying a recognition of suffering and a kind of a, what we would now call trauma-informed means of dislodging that suffering from our bodies. These are the things we want to be reflecting on. So I just want to put as a as a background, again, some of these core themes of the Buddhist tradition that I want to be in conversation with for this project. Um, we know that the Four Noble Truths, what's been called the Four Noble Truths, or some folks now say, maybe we should sometimes think of it as the ennobling truths, really, to think about the impact of these. But the first, there is suffering. And I put in brackets for our purposes. There's racial suffering as well, right? So there is that suffering. And the question is, what do we mean by suffering? Engaging perhaps with, um, again, conditioned reality in ways that amount to clinging, uh, um, greed, patterns of craving on the one hand, um, hatred, resistance, pushing away on the other, or um, delusion, ignorance, causes of suffering. Do they show up around race and racism? Are we clinging to notions of who matters and who doesn't, or how to define myself and how to define you and you um, in ways that perpetuate a sense of, um, of, of, of despair, pain, uh, dissatisfaction with what is. The, the third truth there being an end to suffering is, I think, something that those of us in the Black experience might be drawn to more, right? Not just that there is suffering, but whew, there is some way to end it. And again, I think these faith songs have a way of inviting us to think about how we might end suffering and experience the ending of suffering in our bodies right now. That we're not actually waiting for other, you know, for that change that is going to come, if you will, and as, as this title of this talk suggests. Yes, there is this sense that we want release from the suffering and that notion of change embeds in that, this desire to alleviate suffering, racial suffering. But this third, third noble truth for me is an invitation for us to think about how the very many different ways we might end that suffering right where we are right now, even as we work to change systems to minimize the ongoing delivery of, of in inequity and unfair treatment in our times. So the end of suffering, all right, the eightfold path, of course. Um, and again, just really quick shorthand references to different dimensions of this eightfold path here. Understanding, again, these four noble, noble truths as an aspect of what we might mean by right view, right? Seeing the conditioned nature of reality and seeing the capacity to kind of awaken to that. And, and really it, not just seeing it and perceiving it, but having a felt, I think, embedded in the body understanding of this, the right intention, right? The desire to avoid patterns that recreate the, the core sufferings of greed, hatred, and delusion, right? Speech, minimizing language that perpetuates untruths, that's careless in so far as its risk of causing more harm, that intentionally distresses. And here, I just want to name that, again, I think of race sometimes as part of what is part of a deep untruth about humanity that we've all imbibed. Race itself, right? This It's like one of the big lies. I think we are in an era where we understand that cultures create lies, co powerful forces within cultures create lies and disseminate them. We've lived a bit of that in our time right here, right now. And I think the lie of race and the, you know, and, and the racial order 
is so deeply pervasive in our culture, in world culture, in Europe and in different parts of the world. Deep, deep culture, deeply embedded in Christianity, deeply embedded in the precursors of in the processes and practices of enslavement and genocide in the United, in what we now call the United States. Um, these ideas of racial difference and othering have their precursors well back into antiquity. And then they got, you know, a kind of a modern interpretation as a justification for enslavement and, you know, radical exploitative practices that justified racial capitalism. So there, we have this modern, you know, kind of redux and tightening up of, of, of this kind of body-based othering that has its precursors in antiquity. We come up with the language of race, the hierarchies of racism, all of these things in the era of the, you know, post-revolution uh, caused by, you know, um, transatlantic slavery. And we have a particular example in the United States that we're still working with. But a big lie at the heart of all of it, that somehow we're fundamentally um, of different worth and value by virtue of our racial identities. Um, and so again, these other um, aspects of the Eightfold Path that we can talk about, I want to just name right action as a really important aspect of what it is that we might see as the way, a way toward liberation and to non-harming, right? We're trying to minimize suffering, right? We're trying to act in ways, not just think in ways and be, but act in ways that minimize suffering. And that's where equity work maybe comes in um, and right livelihood and effort. We can talk more about it, but right mindfulness, looking at um, the body, the feelings, the, the sort of um, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of of feeling state of thoughts and, and other phenomena, phenomena in the world, right? Um, by which consciousness arises. Um, mindfulness is an important aspect, I would say, of how it is that we might become more aware of the way race is showing and racism shows up in our world. And again, right, concentration, again, that ability in a certain sense to downregulate to kind of um, shift out of this sort of tight engagement with the experiences in the world that cause suffering and open up to, again, um, the equanimity, if you will, that can come from recognizing um, the spaciousness, the emptiness of these experiences, even though they may cause great harm and pain. So it's that both and, it's seeing deeply into the true nature of reality while at the same time, time having insight into how race and racism is causing suffering. This is what we're inviting. And so embedded, embedded context matters greatly. And the context I'm gonna raise here is my own experience being born in North Carolina going to a school that was still officially segregated starting that in 1972, despite the fact that Brown versus Board had happened almost, you know, a generation ago before that, right? In 1954, 55, 56, we were really engaging with efforts to enact in law this notion of desegregation. But in 1972, that had not shown up yet. And so my public school that I entered in kindergarten still officially segregated and another important institution in my world, Faith Knapp Tabernacle Church, Faith Tabernacle, <laughs> a church where um, for me from a very young age, I learned something about the importance of song. The first song that we heard there for me or that I recall was a song called This Little Light of Mine. So this is me here in this little blue shirt with my mother. Uh, Ruth and my sister Shonda and my other sister Tony. Um, so there were there was this black feminine subcontext, and my grandmother is not in this picture, but she by then had been called to the ministry, so she was a regular member, um, and we all therefore were of Faith Tabernacle Church. But there I learned a song that some of you may know called "This Little Light of Mine." Um, as a little girl, I remember that song as being maybe one of the first faith songs, one of the first songs that would help me to feel a sense of purpose and a sense of worth and a sense of includedness in the great 
mystery of life, despite whatever else was, you know, mess what other kinds of messages would come at not just a black racialized person, but in a f female body as a child of that time. So this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This is just an example. You know, you hear that. You're in that small church. We're holding hands on a Sunday morning. Whatever difficulty has happened in that week, you are holding hands, you're singing together songs like this, and there is this sense of relief from all of that suffering. There is this sense of a safe space where you can be reborn and renewed by virtue, not only of the, the, the liturgies and the teachings from the pulpit, but by virtue of the engagement together in song and in this embodied connection. So I wanna um, invite um, uh, the, we've got Learned here, one of the uh, supporters here, from Rice to play this song and video, a change is gonna come. We'll come back. I'm gonna stop the share myself and invite um, Leonard to go ahead and share this song as another example. And we'll reflect together right before you start to play it, uh, Learned. I just wanna set it up just this much. Again, this song comes out in 1964. I personally was born in 1967. So I feel I was born in a world that had in some measure been infused, my own cultural context had been infused in some measure by this particular song. And here now we're seeing the song along with a, a, a contemporary video that is meant in some ways, I think, to help us wake up to the contemporary resonance of this song, again, born in the era of the civil rights movement, if you will, the 1964, um, but with contemporary resonance today. And now invite us to both listen to the song, but also watch the video and feel the way in which it, well, let's see how it impacts the body. Notice any sensations in the body. Notice thoughts that are coming up and emotions that come up for you as you listen to this song and watch the video. Thank you, Lynn. So thank you very much, Learned, for sharing that. And all of us here, I want to just pause for a second and really invite uh, kind of coming into the body right now and feeling what are the resonances, what is alive in you in this moment as a result of having experienced that song and the visuals associated with it. Noticing first the sensations in the body. And there may be some words that are coming up, maybe some emotions that are coming up as you notice these sensations, maybe thoughts, maybe some, certain images are, um, were particularly touching for you. Maybe just the quality of the voice that we just experienced. So just creating a bit of spacious opportunity to reflect on how those words and images, the sounds that you just heard, how you have received that into your being in your body right here, right now. And so there may be words coming up or phrases and if possible, you might journal, make notes of them. And the invitation is to think about how a, a song, a meditation on such a song may open us up to some of the ways that we have been experiencing 
race, racism, its legacies, the legacies of oppression, and the ways in which those experiences are in our bodies and prompting thoughts, emotions. As best we can, then, the invitation is to become aware of these aspects and then experiment with different ways of releasing um, or integrating more deeply what we know into actions that we might take. Compassionate actions aimed at alleviating suffering, including our own, but the suffering that we experience in the world. And so, um, again, if there are any thoughts coming up, reflections, emotions, please take time to honor them. Note them down and maybe journal later or, or just give yourself time to process as we go. What I want to now share, I want to go back to the slides and see if I can, whoops, share the screen once again. And um, again, invite us just to be reflecting on these, these words. I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. Again, I was born into a world. This notion of being born, I think uh, for me and about, how it is that our practices of awakening in the Buddhist and other traditions are called forth in some sense by a meditation on these words and this, and this kind of faith song. What does it mean to be born by that river? I think of rivers metaphorically as being about the river of our experiences, um, the river of the life in which we're embedded, um, I happen to know that the author of this song, Sam Cooke, was born um, in in uh, Mississippi, um, as was my father, actually, probably um, not too far off contemporaneously with Sam Cooke, and maybe not too far off geographically from Sam Cooke. So... Um, and there are you know, many actual right, rivers running through Mississippi, right? or not many. The, um, uh, the, there may have been an actual literal river right, by, which you, by which you was born. But so being born and being born into a world, into a context matters. And he's speaking to that. What does it do? What is it, how are we impelled into action by virtue of where we're born and the circumstances and conditions into which we're born. Some of us feel like we've been born running by virtue of the context, the circumstances, the conditions into which we've been born. And some of us have felt more at ease, have been more protected. And there's so many gradations of, of degrees of experience around this. No one way, no, no one aspect of even the Black experience around this. Uh, for me, I felt there was a need to leave North Carolina. I'm living in California now. Um, so there, this idea of running, leaving, migration, try, seeking a better life is a feature of my experience as a Black, racialized, cisgender uh, female, seeking a better life than uh, it seemed was prefigured for people like me in the context in which I was born in North Carolina in 1967 three years after this song came out. But coming, and so coming to California did it represent a kind of migration, but it is of a piece or not unlike the various ways that human beings have moved throughout black history. Yes, the great migration from the South to the Chicago, right where Sam Cooke's family moved from Mississippi to Chicago. But 
and many, and again, you know, we Isabel Wilkerson has helped has helped us with her great book, The Warmth of Other Suns, to, to understand that kind of migration was not uncommon, right? Blacks moving from the South to Chicago to Harlem to parts of California, frankly, in Texas. These out migrations seeking a better life. And that's a feature of human kind, members of humankind who suffer wherever they are. And it's a feature of our lives right now. Migrants coming from south of the border, migrants seeking a better life still from around the world's movement, movement, movement. So many human beings on the move as a result of the context within which they, they are suffering and seeking a better life. That better life, a long time coming. We know a change is going to come. And so in singing about it, we were hoping in some sense to bring it into being and to maybe transform the suffering that we're feeling into something that can feel more joyful and more liberating. It's been too hard living. The existential circumstances of being a Black man at that time, not easy. Not easy today of being a Black Again, cisgender, female, uh, you know, of the age that I am, <laughs> born in 67, you know what that is, right? I'm um, in my early 50s now. I will name that proudly, right? It's not easy living and yet fear, right? So recognizing that there's some emotion that comes up, becoming mindful, becoming aware that we fear the pain of our existence. Not hiding that, not denying that, not necessarily wallowing in it, right? But naming it. So I think what the, these practices of, of looking at the Black experience, looking at it as a kind of robust engagement with the reality, we're not trying to bypass the fact that there is suffering based on race and that some of us are more vulnerable to that than others. And that there are um, efforts ongoing to alleviate that suffering. And we're inviting all of us as we practice together to do what we can to see that sort of external mindfulness as a part of our practice. The inner mindfulness, bodily experience, thoughts, emotions, sensations, as a support for doing the work of external mindfulness. What's going on here? Who's at home here? Who's made to feel comfortable here? Who still feels other here? And this can be a feature even of our exploration of our retreat spaces, our meditation spaces in the Buddhist tradition and in other traditions, in our schools, in our programs, who belongs, who's given to feel a sense of belonging here? What groups, what voices, what experiences are not centered, are not as welcome, explicitly or implicitly? And how do we make the changes that we might make from where we are in recognition of this? I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me, don't hang around. How do people get this message of you don't belong here explicitly and implicitly, even in our culture and our time right now, in our institutions, in our departments? The movie is a stand-in, a metaphor for many different places where, or going downtown, where we might find ourselves moving in our migrations through the world, through our, the context within which we live, and not always met with welcome. It happens in our Buddhist settings as well. I know this from the stories I've heard. I know this from my own experience. Um, and so really, this, this, the call is for us to really look at how some of these patterns of racialized bias and the legacies of white supremacy show up even in our religious and Buddhist institutions? That's the question. That's a question. I'm not here to present the answers. I'm here to amplify and invite our lifelong engagement with these questions, not episodic, not like, oh yes, we thought about that last week. Let's ask ourselves, how might that still be happening today? And, and continue this as a moment by moment inquiry into acting with integrity in a world where racism still matters. That's a way in which I think the change can happen and be brought into being. We go to each other and say, help me, please. Someone will raise, hey, this is an issue here. I need your help. I need to build 
allies. I need to work in solidarity with people of different backgrounds to address this issue. But sometimes we get told this is not a problem. This is not, you know, maybe it's really, you just need to practice with this. Instead of seeing this as an opportunity to, to move practice from personal to interpersonal to systemic collective for liberation. So yeah, embodied mindfulness for me is this kind of being attending, paying attention on purpose, internally and externally, right? To what is alive, what is present. So um, that internal and that external aspect is what I want to name. And this is consistent with the early Buddhist teachings. One of my teachers and friends, um, the beautiful Buddhist teacher, Analio, the scholar of early Buddhism, um, recently wrote a paper um, called Confronting Racism with Mindfulness. Uh, it came out just last year, and you can look it up. And in that, he's talking about these external and internal dimensions of mindfulness that invite us to engage with racism and to deconstruct systems of oppression as Buddhist practice, as Buddhist practice that's consistent with the early teachings of the Buddha. Okay, so I'm not the only person inviting us to think about mindfulness as this opportunity to become awake to the internal and the external ways in which we are invited to reenact patterns and practices that, uh, that unnecessarily cause harm. And it, the invitation, of course, being to alleviate that harm. Mindfulness, I'm not going to stay on these slides for very long, but again, there's a lot of research that indicates that it can actually be of this sort of pragmatic support for transforming the suffering we feel as a result of um, racism and inequity. So for those of us who've been targeted, I can say from my own experience, these practices are part of what helps alleviate my own sense of suffering, but also including the song practices that I'm alluding to here, the practices of being with music, of being with others and hearing our voices and hearing my own voices helps help voice, <laughs> helps dislodge some of the ways that the pain, the anguish is in my own heart. I happen to be one of those people who can, who takes in, who sees and, and sits with people who are suffering. And therefore I have to really work not to, to, not to let my own spirit, right, start to be impacted by the suffering that is it, that if, you know, if we're willing to turn toward, we can see everywhere. Reclaiming the self and revivifying the sense of I matter and I'm alive is an invitation to me of mindfulness. And it's an invitation of these faith songs. And it's essential for decolonizing and disrupting the practices of oppression, because one of the ways that oppression shows up is with this disconnecting of us from a sense of our embodied worth. So um, again, there's a lot of research on mindfulness as a support for minimizing the harms of racism. I'm just going to plop the, this slide here and just say that we need more research of this sort. But if you're of a, you know, one of those who are looking for research around this um, and would like to contribute to it, here are resources that can support you and that you can build on for um, looking at how mindfulness can minimize the effects of bias. Again, we're talking about integrating that research then into how we are, to how we teach, to how we practice, and to um, opening up the aperture on what counts as practice to include things like maybe these faith songs. So again, seeing meditation, chanting, we already know traditional strains of that. There are strains that include chanting, but singing and singing in this tradition. I want to now turn and invite Lerna to, to perhaps do one or two more songs. We're not going to unpack them quite as much, but if you will, Lerna, play for us this song, Freedom, and then I think we're going to close with one more song or shift into Q&A after one more song. So I'll pause. And again, we're not going to comment much on this, but I want us to do the same practice of listening with your whole body, noticing thoughts, emotions, sensations that come up for you as you do. Oh, wait, no, that, not that one, but yeah, there we are. <laughs> no unity, no power. 
white power for white people, black power for black people, 1967, the Black Panther Party, the movement, freedom. Let's talk about freedom. 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 We will not bow down to our racism. We will not bow down to injustice. We will not bow down to exploitation. I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. Now this is time for free your mind and soul. Yo, I'm the story I've never been told. Ladies, you got to demand what you want and what we want is respect, right? Come and take a walk with me, close a walk with me, see what only I can see. What's this, guys? Check this. Watch this. Turn up the set us free from all the chains that find me. Let us run in our own direction. Let us go. Let your people try to teach us. I know why you would like to bring us down. Because we have all the dirt on you. You try to tell us that our lives don't mean a thing. But we know so much better, so we're going to take our freedom.
Ha, 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 ha. So <laughs> inviting, taking a few maybe deeper than usual breaths right here, right now. Ha, and perhaps as you release the breath, allowing it to be whew, a breath that's uh, released with a little bit of sound so you can hear ha, the sound of your own body. And just notice what is alive in you right now, having witnessed that video, the some of the words may and images may still be resonating with you right now. So what are the ways in which you're feeling the body impacted and maybe or maybe feeling emotions or maybe having some thoughts come up or some of your own stories and experiences coming up? How are we impacted by songs like this? This, I think, is every bit a kind of mindfulness practice and inquiry that we can invite into the work of embodied mindfulness, this kind of mindfulness that apprehends a personal, interpersonal, and collective systemic awakening invitation for us all. I will just say that, you know, in traditionally white spaces where, for example, mindfulness in the West evolved, right? I mean, you know, a lot of what we see as mindfulness, even the different ways we see Buddhism interpreted, is coming through the lens of and experiences of, of, of folks who have been racialized as white, who've lived in white spaces and places. So it should not really, really surprise us if we pause and stop and think about it, uh, to see that the ways we've been given to think about mindfulness in Buddhism bear a bit, if you pause and look at it, the way of thinking about what it means to be free that leans a bit more into white racialized experience than others. So this collective project of freedom hasn't been articulated so much as a part of Buddhism or part of mindfulness, I think in part just simply because those who think in a certain way, again, these are my friends and teachers, so this is not a knock against the beautiful teachings that I've been privileged to encounter by my white teachers, often white male teachers. But it is just to name that if you're teaching and interpreting from a particular position, that may not be the whole story. And so again, because our contexts matter, they influence how we see the world, what teachings we highlight, what we focus in, what things we, we, we bring into you know normal, regular, everyday conversations about what mindfulness is and what things that are, are, might be brought in, but we just don't mention. And so I think it's really important that um, Analio and other teachers have been highlighting that in the early Buddhist teachings, an engagement with external mindfulness was real and present. The Buddha, for example, commented on the legacies of the caste system in ancient India and how it wasn't caste or identity in some caste group or another that would determine your potential for liberation. It was your actions in the world, not your identity, but your actions. So an ethic of liberation based on how it is that we engage with each other in support of our own and others' liberation. One last song before I really close and just turn to questions. Um, Learn it if you would bring up the song, The Joke. And I will just mention that this is a song that, um, let me actually, before you you bring it up, before you bring it up, um, Learn it, let me share a bit more of my screen here. I want to, um, again, we're not able to go through these lyrics from Freedom, but you can find it. It's this 1995 song, Various Artists. It came out with a, a soundtrack of a movie called Panther. But I want us to look at this song, The Joke by Brandy Carlisle. If you know Brandy, I, I'm not sure. I want to make sure I'm spelling her name correctly. 
it's if I'm not, somebody chat me on that. But if you know, I think I might not be spelling Carlisle quite correctly, but we'll double check that. She is a singer who is not, you know, a representative of the Black experience in, in conventional terms, as we know it, how we define it, in the categories we've received and that we often continue to enact. But if we start to ask ourselves, first of all, we know that Black, they, they, you know, they, the biological notions of race are part of the big lie. Really, it invites us to be thinking about, well, what is the Black freedom movement? And what are some of the songs that bear uh, some stamp of resonance with that freedom movement? And to me, this is, this is one of them. And I want to invite, let me just stop there and invite Lerner to share it. And then we can reflect on, again, is this a, a, a freedom song similar to that in the Black tradition that we have been experienced sharing? Um, let's just listen to the song, Learn It. <laughs> Just pausing again, letting these words, those images, again, be brought into this reflective space, sensations in the body, thoughts, emotions that come up. This is a picture of one of my classes at the University of San Francisco, a class devoted to racism and justice in American law, where we go out on retreat to recover a sense of ourselves, right? We're studying racism and reading cases and learning the language and figuring out what a microaggression might feel like and work, be like and how to talk about all of that and how to talk about the legacies of our history together from our different experiences. But we realize we need to heal. So we, you know, we do retreat too. And we walk together in the spirit of Thich Nhat Hanh, being peace, being change, recognizing that we are all just one family who've forgotten who we are. Nan Suggs, my grandmother, that teacher that I mentioned of Faith Tabernacle Church from North Carolina who's teaching here. Just one family who forgotten who we are. My grandmother didn't go to school past elementary, picked tobacco in the South, cleaned houses for other people, but knew this. Similar to this, another great teacher. One of the many problems we face today arising out of our conflicting ideologies is losing sight of the basic humanity binding us together as one human family, the Dalai Lama, okay? So this insight is something we actually know, and it's one of the big lies that we don't talk about our experiences from this place. So when I see that Brandy Carlisle faith song, it really invites opening up the curriculum opening up the invitation to waking up in ways that are informed by not only what we might call the black experience in traditional terms, but seeing the intersectionality of that and seeing how it opens us up to suffering of all kind, of all background and what we can do to end it from where we are. So I am going to stop here. I have to tell you, I'm, I have a very hard stop right at 11, 11.29. So we really I have to be on another session at 11.30. So we don't have very much time for questions, but I see in the Q&A box um, one uh, observation that I've already referred to about, yeah, someone asked whether or not entering Buddhist spaces has ever made me feel like I had to check my DNA at the door. Um, 
and like those identities weren't welcome or didn't have a place in Buddhist spaces and how flexible can Buddhism be? Again, I've been speaking to that, I think, as we've gone through. And I think this is why I'm here to invite us into inquiry around this, creating space for the voices who might inform your teaching community, your class, your institution about the need to create more of a sense of belonging or to allow the belonging that is true for all of us. And if we are fortunate, we feel this as part of what happens when we practice, whether through song, whether through sitting, whether through movement, through all of the body scans, there are very, all of the practices in my view are meant to deliver us into a sense of our inherent belonging. But there's a such a wide range of practices coming from our different experiences that need to be given voice, right? And if you're in a place where you're not allowed to speak about your own unique experience, to me, the invitation is either to transform that space so you can or find the space where you can because we all deserve this and we all will learn best and thrive best when we can create places where that is so, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. I see some beautiful, positive affirmations in, in the Q&A box. Um, and if anybody has any thoughts or just reflections on what's coming up for you in response to this, again, I have about five more minutes and I want to give them over to you all. If there are any questions or reflections, what's come up for you, ways you might think of a personal curriculum for you personally, or a curriculum you might Im involve your organization with, whether it's your department, your, you know, some reflection on curriculum and practices and how to infuse more diversity of actual lived liberationist experience whether it be through song or through something else, into what we see as awakening practice, consistent in some ways, different in some ways, but of a piece perhaps with that deep liberative potential that is at the heart of what we know as the teachings of the Buddha. And I would just say that in my view, you know, we're all one family and truly have evolved from you know, the continent of Africa. And so every deep teaching, I believe, has its roots in some measure in that continent and in the sensibilities that come from a deep appreciation that we are really one family. So the specific teachings really bear specific cultural stamps, um, Asian heritage cultures that have lovingly transmitted the teachings of the Buddha, for example, I want to honor and name that. And at the same time, name that human history is hundreds of thousands of years old and recorded human history, much, much small, tiny piece of that. So that deep hundreds of thousands of year history that is that went unrecorded um, is, I think, part of the myth and mystery, the unknowable that we must know is part of whatever recorded teachings or deliverers, delivering, delivered teachings we are, are given to receive. So just know that part of the deep unremembered past is this common humanity that split off into different tribes, but are still basically like a family that's dispersed itself. So thank you all. And I'm going to see if there's any more reflections in the Q&A box. Um, I am. So once I'm hearing a reflection, I'm reminded of how influential African-American history and experience have been in helping me understand and deal with the racism myself and my family have dealt with as Latina and Latinos. Yeah, Latinx experience. Um, much appreciation for the reminders and insights here for giving me ways to think and practice and what potential it holds. Yes. Bringing our own experience. This is exactly why I'm here. Um, someone asked, can you comment on the necessity and power of Sangha in embodying these very moving realizations that come from these songs? Yes. The power of Sangha. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Again, one of the legacies of our time is to teach the you know traditions of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha through these devices, right? The you know, personal, just find your app, meditate on your own by yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's some beauty in that, really. And we are called, I think, to remember how important it is to come together, to practice together, to be together as human beings in all its challenges. Yeah, I know it's difficult sometimes for us when we come together from all our radically different experiences. Of course, it's difficult. I think part of what our society needs to evolve from is this this idea that life is everything is going to be easy and mistake free. No. Being in don't know mind, waking up. Another way of thinking about that is to say, well, we're all somehow deluded and there's a lot we don't know. And so if we can create communities where we can practice lovingly encountering each other in our not knowing, lovingly helping each other grapple with dissolving the egotistical sense of life. This is what I know and this is who I am. Well, that's sort of what you know. There's more to be known and who you are is ineffable. So we can go with the resume or we can tap into the resume and then drop it when, or tap into our lived experiences, our heritages, freedom songs and stories, but also open up to what's there for me to learn from you in your freedom song, heritage and story. So I, I must, I must go very soon. I'm going to open up the box one more time just to see if there's anything more. Yeah, personal education path. Again, I wrote uh, this book as you some has been has been mentioned, um, partly because I wanted to offer a path. <laughs> Thank you. This one video cannot do that. This one book can't. And even though my editors and publishers were like, "Can it be shorter than it is? It's longer than we thought it would be." <laughs> And I'm working on a next book. So to me, this is lifelong, but I do offer my book and other teachings. And I just want to say I'm one of your family members now. So um, please feel free to email me. You can contact me at uh, rondavmcgee.com or you can, find, you, can, you can contact me. I'm here uh, to support you on the journey. And I'm just seeing one last of these uh, contributions to our Q&A. I was sobbing after two seconds into the first video. Yeah. We need to cry. We need to feel again. Part of how the legacies of oppression shows up is because in that not being able to feel. And we need to wake up to then be able to to serve. So thank you all. Um, Thank you. Thank you. If someone's mentioning they started getting out the vote in populations embedded in racism. Yeah. Action as a Buddhist and a friendly person, action is a freeing, is a very freeing inwardly and in the larger community. We have to take action. It's got to be what we meditate on from the cushion outward. All right, my dears, I have to go. Until next time, stay connected. I just thank you so much, Anne, and learn it, and all of you at Rice for this beautiful opportunity to present to you as part of the Rockwell series. Thank you. Thank you so much for this inspiring talk. Just wonderful, just a welcoming, just a modeling of how we are all inherently belonging and and just offering us that space and letting that counter the lies of racism. Thank you, Rhonda McGee. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you, my dear, for, for, you know, staying with me on the journey and inviting me some months ago. And here we are. I'm so excited. May we meet again. Thank you. May we meet again. Be well. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us and for the questions that you posed and the community that you shared. And we would like to uh, let you know and tell your friends that this lecture and all of our Rockwell lectures are, are will be uh, online. So please look for that. Um, and Marcy, I don't know if you or Diana have a screen share about the upcoming uh, events you have. We would just, yes. On um, March 11th is our next and last 
the talk at 3 p.m. Please put that on your calendar. Another wonderful and our closing of this series, which has been very successful. And yes, do let your networks know that these lectures, if people miss them or want to view them again or want to use them in classroom teaching, as I plan to do, uh, they're going to be available. I don't know if you have that link, uh, Marcy or Diana, but you will be able to find it if you Google and we will make it available as we can. So thank you so much, Learned. Thank you, Marcy and Diana, without whom goodness, uh, impossible. You have worked for over a year, months and months and months. And rally.rice.edu has an events page. Thank you, everyone. You will find information about the uploaded videos there. Thank you, Jalissa. May everyone uh, go on inspired with strength and uh, heartfelt conviction that change is coming.